Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. So I wanted to make a quick video to go over uh, real estate income and expense analysis. Uh, really this what we're going to cover is just a lot of financial management uh, topics in this video. Uh, for anyone that's thinking about investing in real estate and being a landlord, uh, this will be really good information to just get a good understanding of what are the expenses like on a rental property, uh, what are the expenses to be aware about, and also how does this impact your returns. So uh, hopefully you guys find this video helpful. Uh, so without further ado, let's get straight into it. So I created a very simple model that will just show us the income and expenses for a two units uh, residential property, uh, rental property uh, to, for, for as an investment. And the two unit types that we have, we have a two bedroom, one bath, and we have uh, two units. So we'll consider this to be a duplex. And then uh, we'll go over this in a little bit, but we also have some unit renovation costs, which we'll discuss uh, and some of the terms here. Uh, so what we're going to assume is that we have a duplex and we're going to rent each duplex for $1,700 a month, which is about market rate. Okay. Uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to have some assumptions here that are going to impact our, our income statement. Uh, the first one is vacancy. Uh, vacancy is going to be uh, basically any time where any of your one or two units is vacant, where you don't have any re uh, tenants in, in the spaces or the units. Uh, you can find this metric by doing you know, a market research in, in, in your area, uh, going to Google. Um, you know, typically in cities like Phoenix and Texas, uh, vacancies, vacancies seem to be pretty low, somewhere around like the 5% uh, to 8%. So this is a metric that we can kind of play around with just to be, you know, more aggressive or more conservative. Uh, for the purposes of this video, we're going to assume a, a vacancy rate of, uh, let's go with 8%. We think we can have a more occupied building throughout the year. So we'll just assume 8%. Uh, that'll help boost our returns. Uh, I went ahead and added a bad debt collection loss. Uh, this is going to be uh, an expense or an income loss for any tenants that are currently occupying, occupying the space but are not paying rent, uh, are not making the rent payments. And this is, you know, we experience this commonly in throughout the COVID where a lot of cities like Los Angeles had eviction moratoriums where landlords couldn't technically or legally uh, evict tenants and so they weren't really required to pay any rent so um, you know this is this is a metric you want to keep in mind um, for, and you know so we'll assume that as for for bad debt we're going to assume a, a half a percentage point collection loss as far as operating expenses um, this can vary based on 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 the landlord and also the the type of buildings um, generally the, the lower the operating expense ratio, the better. Um, you know, if, if you can manage to keep costs low, you can probably achieve a, an, occup an operating expense ratio of 35%, which is fantastic. Uh, but some buildings have higher, you know, ex operating expenses. And so, you know, when you're underwriting or making, you know, making an assumption on a real estate investment, you know, my approach is I, I prefer to be uh, more conservative. And then once I actually invest in the property, I try to beat those metrics. So for this purposes, we'll keep this at 50%. Uh, and then that way we can just be more conservative on that side. Okay, uh, the next one is CapEx reserve. This is any money that you're gonna set aside for any capital improvements in the property. This can be exterior, such as landscape, you know, exterior paint. Uh, this can also be used for any uh, unit renovations when tenants move out and you need to upgrade the units. This can be also plumbing or any electrical repairs. Uh, so this is money you want to set aside. And just a, just a general rule of thumb, you know, you typically want to s save at least 5% of the total income for the month uh, and, and have that as a capital expense reserve. Now, if you feel like the property will require more capital expenses uh, down the line, then you may want to, like, such as like a roof repair, you may want to increase this CapEx reserve to maybe like, you know, 10% or so, somewhere along that. Um, yeah. Okay. And then the next one is an asset management fee. The, this fee is really paid to an asset manager. Um, so if you're the landlord and you're managing the property yourself, or you have a third party property management, you know, this is a nice way that you can pay yourself uh, an, for managing the assets. 
um, a, a nice one percent fee. But again, it's it's really just a, a, a fee that you can pay yourself just to have some income while you own the property. And then the last one we have here is LTV, which stands for loan to value. We'll get more in detail with this, but um, uh, this is going to be related to the mortgage that we take out on the property. Um, so we'll just discuss that in the, in the, later in the video. Okay, so let's start off with just a very si uh, simple example. Here we have month one. Uh, let's take a look at all of our income. So we're going to start off with market rent. So the market rent is basically the maximum dollar that we can get per unit uh, uh, per month. So we have here $1,700 and we have two units so total we get a market rent of $3,400. Uh, the next line item is lost to lease. This line item is uh, would basically be any unit that is below market. So for example if we had if one of these units was paying less than uh, $1,700 a month that the difference between the market rents and what they're currently paying would be lost to lease. So in this case, let, let's just do an example really quick. So let's say we had um, one tenant that was paying uh, $1,500 a month, right? And the mark, we know the market rent is $1,700. So the difference would be $200. Uh, and, but this would actually be a negative number because that's the money that we're losing for not having a tenant paying market rate. So we would actually be losing $200 if that if that tenant was paying $1,500 a month. Um, so but for this example, we're just gonna assume that both uh, tenants are paying uh, market rate. So our gross potential income, the maximum that we can gain here uh, in rent, rental income is $3,400 a month. Okay, the next, the next uh, line item here is gonna be rent, all uh, items related to rent loss. Uh, as we just discussed earlier, we have vacancy of 8%. Uh, so that is just a simple calculation. We just take 8% of the total market rates, uh, assuming that 8% of the year uh, we're going to have empty units. And this could be very possible when tenants uh, reach their lease expirations and they decide not to renew with you. You have to go ahead and find new tenants uh, to fill up the space. So that could take, you know, it could take you can if, if, if you plan ahead you can pre-lease it before the expiration or, or at the expiration uh, but if you mismanage you know this can easily turn into uh, a couple of weeks to maybe a month or two to to release your unit uh, concession I left this line item blank uh, this is a line item that uh, it's kind of uh, it's not really a reoccurring uh, rental loss item uh, this is any, any specials that you could offer your tenants uh, most commonly, we, we use concessions when they're coming up for renewals or we get new leases. We'll offer you know $300 off uh, first month's rent. So it's really not a reoccurring expense. So for the purposes of this model, uh, we're just going to assume that we're not going to offer any concessions. Um, you may want to adjust this as you go, um, but just something to keep in mind. Um, so bad debt, we talked about bad debt. Uh, we're assuming a half a percentage point of the total gross potential rents. Uh, minus the vacancy, we're going to assume that throughout the month, you know, there's a potential there's a, there's a potential that tenants uh, will not make rent payments. So just again, this is something we can be conservative. You you can zero that out if you want to be more aggressive. Uh, that'll just help boost your returns. But uh, in the real estate environment that we've seen the last few years, you know, I think it's 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 not the worst idea to assume you might have some delinquency uh, built up. Um, okay, so that total gives us our total rental income of $3,112. And, uh, $3, and uh, th th there could be potential for some additional income. Uh, for example, we have rubs. Uh, rubs is basically when the landlord bill bills back any utility expenses to the tenant. So this can include water, uh, stuff like that. Um, so you can you can have some some bill backs here uh, to to have some rub rub income. Um, you know you can also implement some sort of pet rent fee if if there's a tenant. You know typically if you have especially if you have carpet in your units and you have tenants that have pets and you know sometimes the pets will urinate in the carpet. Um, you know that 
that will have you you're gonna have to pay for that when the tenant vacates the space and you have to clean the carpet so you know you can implement a pet rent fee if, if they have any pets of let's say you know 10 15 20 dollars a month 25 dollars a month and that will help increase the um, the total income uh, one thing I do want to say that if you do find the uh, areas where you can add uh, some additional fees to your uh, tenants, uh, that ultimately will increase the value of the property because you're increasing the income. And, and as long as there's a positive effect in the net operating income, uh, that's going to increase the value of your property. So just areas where you can find areas of opportunity to increase the value of your property. Uh, if, if there's a laundry... Uh, on sites uh, at your property, you can charge a laundry fee or maybe, maybe have like some laundry uh, coin dispensers that you can collect some sort of fees. Uh, that's actually a good idea is to have, or maybe you have laundry inside the units as, as just, a, you know, just a better amenity inside the unit. Um, residential other income, uh, again, I left this blank because this is these are really not really occur, uh, reoccurring every month. But just some areas of opportunity in re residential other income is like one-time application fee or one-time back uh, back uh, background fee, so, so something like that, where you know it's like a one-time fee that will add income to your property. Um, uh, this is a simple duplex, so we're not going to include any any commercial or non-residential other income. Uh, Non-other residential income can include like parking, uh, but we don't have that. It's just too too small of a property. Okay, so that concludes our total income. Uh, we have a total income of 3,112. Uh, next, we'll move over to the expenses. And we're, we're generally gonna have two classifications of expenses. We're gonna have controllable expenses, which are all the expenses that we can uh, control. Uh, but then we're also gonna have uncontrollable expenses, which are really expenses that are out of, out of our control. Uh, so we'll discuss both. Uh, the first one's gonna be payroll and benefits. Um, if you work with a third-party property manage management company, uh, typically you're going to have payroll and benefits because uh, you know they usually charge you for a regional property manager or they'll charge you for a property manager, um, so that and they'll, they'll bill it into the the payroll and benefits. Uh, but if you're, you know, if you have if you're pretty, you know, a, a small property, uh, you you can probably lower this expense. Uh, uh, again, it just depends on how, how the third party manages um, your property. Now, if you self-manage, then this is going to be uh, a zero expense here. Um, so, so again, if you self-manage, you, you know, you can probably lower this expense, uh, which will save you $300. Um, but if you work with third party, they'll, pr they'll most likely uh, have some sort of payroll expenses uh, uh, built to you. Um, this is a small property, so I don't think we need security. Um, general administrative, again, this will be billed to the property from the third party. Um, if you self-manage, this is basically you know general administrative stuff that you may have to expense to the property that's related to the property. Um, so you can go ahead and bill it in general and administrative. Um, I didn't enter any legal expenses, uh, you know, this will be associated with any legal costs with you know related to the property and where you have to hire an attorney uh, you can go ahead and bill it to the property you may want to consider uh, billing these expenses below uh, net operating income which is down here uh, this uh, and I'll go ahead and just highlight this um, this line item here uh, you may want to include any lawyer expenses below this item because uh, if you include it above this net operating income line, it could affect the the value of your property. So, if for example, if I had, you know, let's just say I had a hundred dollars of of legal expenses, uh, you know, you see that that that'll lower my net operating income, which ultimately lowers my my value of the property. So, just be careful where you uh, classify this expense. Um, okay, so moving on, the next one is leasing and marketing. This is a big one uh, because this is you know money that's paid to advertising companies like Apartments.com, you know any any apartment listing websites, um, SEO, internet searches. Uh, you, you may want to you know just have a marketing budget just to keep you know interest high and and just generate demand for your property um, for so that you know you can maximize your occupancy and minimize your your vacancy 
Um, so we put a, a budget there of about, you know, almost $50 a month. Uh, the next one is gen gen janitorial. Um, I, I left this one zero because I'm just going to assume, because it's a small property, that most of the routine repair and maintenance work is going to be done in this line item. So I'm budgeting about $140 um, per month for routine repair and maintenance. And this can be any, any kind of request or, you know, stuff like that. Uh, landscape can be in here as well. Uh, unit turnover costs. So this this expense you will incur once the tenant vacants the space and you have to uh, prep the space for the next tenant. Uh, depending on how the current condition of the unit is, uh, it, it can really range from as little as $1,000 to uh, you're doing full renovations up to about, you know, depending on the area, up to $25,000. So just to give you an example, up here in the right hand corner, we have unit turnover cost. Uh, a quick turn is basically like uh, just a very rough cleanup of the space. You know, maybe you clean the carpet um, um, or maybe, you know, you just do a really quick clean turn on the unit. It may cost, you know, you know it may cost you to pay uh, a, a vendor to go clean the unit. Uh, you can do a partial upgrade. So for example, if there's carpet, you can go ahead and add, you know, wood flooring instead. Uh, just like a minor to upgrade on the unit, which will be a little bit more expensive. And then, of course, you have a full-on renovation where you're doing a full, you know, cabinet upgrade with flooring and bathroom upgrade. Uh, this can cost you as low as ten thousand to, you know, almost twenty-five thousand dollars, depending on uh, your location. Um, so, for the purposes, since we're assuming we're going to have a, an occupant occup, occupied building most of the year, uh, we're not going to assume uh, unit renovation, unit turnover costs. But this is definitely something to look at. Uh, on a yearly basis just to you know make sure you're not you don't get caught off guard when tenants move out of the space uh, pest control again is baked into repair and maintenance so we're not budgeting anything there and then you can have uh, contracted services which basically can include any any expenses related to having contracts with with certain vendors such as like internet or cable um, uh, you know amenities stuff like that uh, you you'll go, you'll go ahead and classify under contracted services um, all right, uh, the next uh, category of expenses is going to be uncontrollable. Uh, you have utilities, obviously, electrical, water, gas. That's going to be an, a monthly expense, and you, re you really don't have any control over it because it's, it's based on, you know, the, the usage of it, so it'll vary every month. Um, trash removal usually is under uh, utilities. I, I don't think that... Maybe those maybe there's a small trash removal fee from the city um, that you want to account for. The next one is insurance. That's going to be uh, you know the insurance to insure your building for, for any general liability, uh, pollution, um, and any other umbrella coverages to make sure to to keep really the landlord protected uh, if there's any you know occurrence that will be a ne negative that will negatively financial impact the landlord. So you want to have insurance on your building. Uh, your biggest operating expense is going to be real estate taxes. So this is something that you want to uh, maybe accrue for every month just so you, you you can sort of set money aside for real estate taxes. Um, in, in real estate, it's common that you can file for a tax appeal. So based on the tax bill that you receive from the city or, or the, the municipality, um, you know, the the city is valuing your property at a current dollar amount and they're charging you a tax rate on it. Um, you can typically work with a tax consultant to file a tax appeal to get a tax deduction. Uh, and that could be a huge, um, uh, that, that can be a huge factor in just saving your operating expenses because you can reduce your taxes and, and that will ultimately put money in your pocket. Uh, so just something to think about. And the last one is the management fee. Again, if you work with a third party, uh, they typically will charge you. If it's a small property, they'll charge you anywhere between eight percent to twelve uh, percent per month. If it's a if it's more of a commercial property where you're managing sixteen more than sixteen units, uh, typically the property management fee percentage goes down. I've seen it as low as like two point five to three point five percent of the the total gross revenue. Um, so. That's something that you want to also factor in. So that gives us all of our uh, total operating expenses. Uh, so you see here our total operating expense for the month is $1,556. That is about 
of our total income, which is what we assumed up here at the top, uh, operating expense ratio of 50%. So we are, this is gonna be our benchmark. Uh, again, we're gonna try to find areas where we can beat this benchmark because that's gonna put more money into our pockets. And then the last one, uh, and then and then and then and then that leads us to uh, net operating income. So this is all of the money that we keep after operations. Uh, and then so the next items that come with this are just going to be a few more items here. So uh, if you remember, we we talked a little bit about setting money aside for any capital expenditures, uh, whether it's unit renovation turns, whether it's uh, exterior costs, landscape, anything like that. Uh, so we're just going to set aside $156. Um, again, if you're the landlord, you can sort of play with this number if you want to reserve less money, if you want to be reserved more money. Again, that's up to you. And then uh, we'll go over mortgage payment in just a bit. But before we get to mortgage payment, let's go over ahead and talk about uh, non-operating expenses. Um, so there's going to be some additional expenses here. So we talked about asset management fee of you know one percent. This would this would generate us thirty dollars. This is money that can go to your pocket as, since you're the one managing the finances. You're gonna manage the, the tax appeals, the insurance renewals. So it's nice to be able to get some money from the property and into your pocket uh, through an asset management fee. And you can increase this by uh, if you want. If you wanted to increase this by two percent. Uh, you know, you're technically paying yourself $62. But because the property doesn't generate a lot of monthly cash flow, I'm gonna go ahead and lower this uh, to 1%. And you don't, and you can actually even lower it to 0% if you want. Um, and the last thing is I, I added in some professional fees, such as uh, accounting, like tax accounting that, you know, you'll do once a year or maybe three times a quarter, or sorry, three times, three, four times a year, uh, every quarter to do your taxes and you have to pay your tax accountant. Um, I also added in legal fees uh, for the business entity. So if you have a, a LLC on the property, the uh, LLCs typically cost about $1,000 uh, a year. Um, so I added in just a, a monthly accrued expense to be able to cover those expenses when they're due. Um, and that will give us our total non-operating expenses. So before tax cash flow, so the last thing we, we want to figure out uh, to figure out what is going to be our net cash flow at the end of the month, uh, we want to figure out how much is our mortgage payment going to be. So, so th this is this is this is based on a lot of different factors, um, but just to give you a, a, a summary, um, if we talk about capitalization rates, which in, in across the United States. Uh, depending on the different markets, um, properties are based on capitalization rates, and this is a metric that that investors use to determine the value of properties. And generally, uh, multifamily properties, rental properties, have a cap rate of 3.5 percent to 4.5 percent, um, and sometimes even 5.5 percent. So this is a cap rate that you want to go based on to find out if the property is worth the, the, the purchase. Uh, and so generally, uh, you want to try to uh, achieve a capitalization rate of, you know, 1% to 2% higher than, than the market cap rate uh, when, when the property is sold. So in this case, if, 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 if the exit cap rates these days is 4.5%, uh, then I would like to achieve uh, let's just say we put 4.5% here. Um, if we do this investment, we will achieve uh, basically 1.18% uh, additional spread o over the, the exit cap rate. And so that is a pretty good cap rate uh, for this deal. And so we'll use that to figure out what our loan, loan amount should be. So based on this cap rate, um, you know, we would have to find a property that's worth around $328,000. Uh, we're assuming we're gonna put down $32,000. We can we can change that to 10% if we, if we wanted to um, by changing, oh, well, sorry, it's already at, at 10% because we're doing 90% loan. Uh, so so we're basically gonna assume that we're taking, we're putting down 10% uh, of the property. Here, I'll just tie this to the loan amount so it's, it's dynamic here. Sorry about this. Uh, one minus ninety percent 
So if we instead took out an 80% loan, then we would um, put down a $74,000 down payment for a value of $370,000, which lowers our cap rate to 5.05%. Uh, so that makes sense because we're low, we're lowering the the debt amount um, because we're putting more equity into the deal. So that it makes sense that our cap rate will go down. Uh, so okay, so so now, so now that we're doing uh, the loan, uh, we basically want to try to get a loan that's fifteen hundred dollars a month. And in order to do that, that we would have to take out a loan that's two hundred ninety-six thousand dollars at four point five percent for um, a, a thirty-year amortization period. So our total loan amount would be two two ninety-six thousand. Uh, which gives us a mortgage payment of fifteen hundred dollars, uh, and that gives us negative cash flow of two hundred and thirty-five dollars, which is not bad considering that if you think about like accounting fees and professional business entity fees, this is not an expense that we're going to see every month. We're just accruing for it, um, so it's it's not like you're going to be, you know, negative cash balance uh, because you're not actually accruing a lot of these expenses. Like for example, the capex reserve. You're gonna have it set aside. Uh, the accounting, the legal fees, you, you're gonna have that aside, uh, and then you may also be able to reduce some of these other expenses, like we talked about the tax deductions. So you can probably lower your your annual tax bill, uh, so that number will go down on a monthly basis. Um, you can probably find some savings in the contracted service by having less contracted services in your building. Um, also, the payroll and benefits. We talked about that. There's probably some savings there. Uh, maybe there's some savings to build back tenants on utilities, um, as well as maybe offering some pet rent fees. Uh, and again, it's just finding areas where we can build, where, where we can um, beat the, the benchmark. And, 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 and again, trying to beat the vacancy. So if you have two units that are fully rented, uh, you can possibly uh, save yourself $200, and that'll put you above uh, positive cash flow. Um, so there you have it. That gives you a general idea of all of the income expenses associated with associated with the rental property. Um, and then you know we can. Uh, I'm going to make a part two video just to go a little bit deeper on this loan. Uh, but generally, you know, this gives you a rough idea in terms of you know how to get how much money you're going to end up at the end of the month. So I hope this video was helpful. If you have any questions, feel, please feel free to leave a comment down below. Uh, thank you for watching the video. I would appreciate it if you like, subscribe. Uh, my YouTube channel to help with the YouTube algorithm. Uh, thank you so much for your time and have a great day.